Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Do You See What I See? NASA's Nature-Based Explorations for Young Minds. My name is Emily and I'm thrilled to welcome you today and to introduce our speaker, Tina Hart Ballinger, who has been working with NASA for over a decade in an educational role. In a minute, Tina is going to um, share a little bit more about it herself. Um, but first, I just wanted to share a bit about um, how this webinar came to be. Um, so when we learned that NASA, which of course is home to some of the world's brightest minds, had educational activities that highlighted the value of being in and learning outdoors, we knew that we had to collaborate. Um, and personally, I sort of uh, geeked out a little bit over the potential of connecting with someone from NASA. I mean, it's NASA. Mm -hmm. um, so we're really happy that Tina was willing and available to share her expertise and activities with our community. So thank you, Tina, for being here. Absolutely. You know, happy. for most people, NASA naturally conjures images of you know, planets, the stars, galaxies, telescopes, and a lot of really far away stuff. Um, but when Tina and I met to discuss this webinar, she shared that the activities that they offer cover much more than that. So today she'll be introducing you to activities and resources available through NASA about clouds, soil, temperature, weather, and much more. These activities focus on observation, curiosity, journaling, engaging the senses, inquiry, and of course, play. And we thought this was just the perfect time of year for this webinar. So educators like you could get ideas for getting outdoors with children as you start the new school year. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today. Uh, my name is Tina Hart Ballinger, and I have been um, associated with NASA Langley uh, originally starting in 2012. And this year transitioned over to work with NASA Goddard. Uh, I am a STEM, uh, Director of STEM Engagement at the contracting office called SSEI. I'll kind of get a little bit more into how all that works in just a moment when I share, when we share our slides. But I was, prior to coming to NASA, I was a science teacher for 18 years, uh, taught math as well. I started in fourth grade. Um, I have an early childhood degree, and then I went back and got my master's in secondary science. So then I taught middle school. So I taught 14 year olds every day for an extended period of time. And I found them to be um, just an amazing group of, of students to work with. But I still love going back and having those opportunities with little ones, especially now that I'm a Nana. Well, that's wonderful. What a great way to use all the um, wonderful knowledge you have, <laughs> applying it on those grandchildren. I know I do that with my nieces and nephews. Okay, I are you ready for your presentation, Tina? Perfect. Absolutely. Okay. And thank you to everyone for sharing those ideas in the chat. Make sure you, you look through those and grab some ideas for your, your students. All right, here we go. Thank you. I want to um, say a special thank you to Natural Start Alliance for allowing me to be part of this webinar today and to share with you uh, my passion. And one of the passions that I have is knowing the benefit that exploring and being part of nature have on the life of a child. Um, and I know that firsthand because I know that my foundation of being allowed to explore for hours and hours um, throughout the day, the world around me and just, you know, ask my questions and uh, do my little investigations that I came up with myself and what that meant to me and how that instilled within me a love of learning um, that is, has, has come with me all the way to today. And in great part, why I am where I am is because I started with being a scientist um, and investigating through my own natural curiosity. Um, I've seen some people that I know well in the, uh, the chat. So thank you, my friends, for being with us. And then thank you to my new friends for being with us. Next slide. My favorite place to be. Now, speaking of being a Nana, this is my oldest granddaughter. And she is so much fun. 
she has all kinds of expressions and she's always taking her journal around because she loves what Nana loves and we love exploring and investigating things. And this, this says it all, this expression, this is how I feel when I'm in nature. Now, maybe not quite that as much excitement if I'm freezing cold, but when that first snow comes and I get to go out and explore, this is kind of how I feel inside. Whether it's the ocean, the mountain, the woods, wherever I am, having the opportunity to be outside and exploring, even as a Nana, I love that opportunity. Next slide. So I mentioned that I um, am with a contracting office called SSAI. So as a contractor under SSAI, I work for NASA. And part of my work for NASA is involved in the GLOBE program. And the GLOBE program, if you want to explore further, is simply globe.gov. And you will find a wealth of information regarding outdoor learner for learning for a, uh, a, all ages. And then I'm also the project manager for NASA GLOBE Goes to Camp. So taking NASA and GLOBE resources to camps a uh, perfect setting for outdoor investigations and very excited to be part of all of the work that uh, I'm engaged in and all of the wonderful people that I have the opportunity to team up with because we all know we accomplish so much more when we have the ability to work with others. Next slide. So it's our birthday week. NASA turned 65 on October the 1st. How could I not lead off with that? Very exciting times um, to know all that NASA has accomplished, all that NASA is going to accomplish in the future um, with those young minds that you're helping to develop today. So happy birthday to NASA. Next slide. So children naturally live in the moment. They're not worried about tomorrow. They're not worried about next week. They're not worried about the people watching them. They allow the moment to be what it is. They find the magic. They see the beauty in everything around them. This is a picture of my son at the beach uh, several years ago. And just that joy that you have chasing the birds, running through the birds, watching them, hearing the waves, all of that excitement that comes by just allowing them to be free, to be out and about exploring and capturing that magical moment uh, that becomes a part of who they become. Next slide. And so what do you see? You know, we've all had those moments when we look up at the sky and we see all kinds of shapes and hopefully you haven't lost that love and that enthusiasm when you look at the sky. You know, do you see a rabbit? Do you see a triceratops? Or do you see a puffy white cumulus cloud? You know, children see all kinds of things in the sky and it's important to encourage them to think, to look, to see, to express, to use their imagination and then also to begin to develop and guide them towards a deeper understanding of what they see. Next slide. So do you see what I see? How do our experiences shape what we see? Now, I live on the East Coast. And when I saw this image, I was like, "Ooh, you know, I know that's a cirrus cloud, but it kind of looks like an ocean wave. Now, when I grew up in the state of Kentucky, in the middle of the country, not near the beach, you know, I would have immediately said, mm, cloud. But now that I'm constantly surrounded by the waves and I have the opportunity to go and I see now more clearly the ocean wave in this image, and you may have as well, but our experiences shape what we see, the knowledge that we gain. And so think about the experiences of your children. Think about what they are experiencing on a daily basis and what they have the freedom to explore. Next slide. 
So everybody loves a matching game. So if you want to take them past the rabbits or past the triceratops and begin to teach them to notice different types of clouds in the sky, why not a matching game? You could have uh, the matches of different types of clouds. You could take pictures of clouds that are familiar to your sky. Um, or you could, um, you know, do one where the clouds are already identified for you and make your own matching game for your students or your own children, or in my case, my grandkids. Next slide. Or what about an art activity? Now, the cloudscape type activity is one in which you can use all kinds of craft materials and uh, take it really far where you do a whole scene of the entire sky. But for our younger learners, we, wanna, we want to make sure that we're not um, bringing them into a situation where there's too many pieces and there's too many things. So we came up with the cloud triangle. And the cloud triangle allows them to touch and to feel materials that are represented uh, by those things they see in the sky and have a similarity between uh, what they're visualizing and what they're touching. And so we have the cloud triangle that teaches the three basic types of clouds, a cumulus, which is just a cotton ball, um, a stratus, that thick layer of cloud, which is represented by a piece of tissue paper, and then cirrus, which are those little wispy clouds up in the top part of the sky. And those are our cirrus and they're made out of yarn that you kind of pull the threads apart to make those wavy little wispy parts. And of course we have um, identific cloud identification charts, which you can locate at the GLOW program. Um, and uh, do just in the search, put cloud chart and it'll pop up for you. And it's a PDF that you can print out um, and get access to that way but they have pictures that they can use to just look at the picture and look at the sky and see what they think they might see. Next slide. So it's always fun to do that with a partner. You could have them partner up and see if they agree on what they see. Next slide. We should also celebrate different perspectives. You know, you may look at something and you may see something entirely different. You may have looked at that cloud a while ago and not seen a rabbit. You may not have seen a triceratops. Um, and looking at this picture, did you see the tree first or did you see the owls? Or do you see the owls at all? It's all about perspective. And it's always important that when your children start to investigate and to see and to learn and to experience, let them see what they see. Don't tell them what they should see. It's very important that you listen and hear their perspective on things because their perspective is important. Who knows? They might discover something that you don't see at all uh, that might become NASA's next greatest discovery. Next slide. Cloud dance. I love children's literature. Not only is there a book called Cloud Dance, but I'm going to tell you about the Cloud Dance in a moment. But this particular storybook is the art in it is phenomenal. And I like to not only connect uh, young learners with nature and outdoor, but also allow them to experience good children's literature that takes them even further. The art shows different types of clouds based on the time of day, by the season, um, just a lot of good images and the words are kind of in a poetic uh, verse. So it's just a really good. And he also has a book that he wrote that's called Sky Tree. And that one has beautiful illustrations as well. Um, and yes, there is um, a water and I think there's a mountain one. So check those out. Next slide. So, you know, talking about perspective and, you know, one of the things I love to do is hike through the woods. 
There's nothing quite as peaceful and as calm as going through the woods and pausing to explore and to listen. Um, in fact, earlier today, I was reading um, a, a book. I, of course, I'm always checking out new books for, for children's literature. And I read this quote. It says, in every walk with nature, one receives far more than they seek. And that's true. You never know what you're going to find or what's going to happen along your way. But let's say you take your children on a hike through the woods and you come into a place, you know, everybody's going to see things differently. Some are going to see the tall, tall trees. Some are going to see the critters in the tree or below the tree. And there's always that one that picks up that shiny little acorn on the forest floor. So you may be the person who looks at the tall, tall tree. You may be the person that's intrigued by all the critters or all the animals or all the birds. Or maybe you're the person that kneels down among the moss and picks up the acorn. Encourage your children to explore all aspects of the forest. You might ask questions like, did you notice? What do you see? What do you think? What do you wonder? All of those kinds of questions to guide them further beyond what they may have noticed, but first allow them to explore what they saw with their eyes and happen to think about from the moment they experienced it. Because remember, it's about experiencing the moments. Next slide. And so tree yoga and the cloud dance. You know, we've talked about some art. We've talked about some questioning. We've talked about a hike. Um, we talked about different aspects of what we see with the clouds and what we see with the trees. So now we need some motion, some movement. You know, think about tree yoga that you could do with your kids where you start out as that little acorn, all kind of small and then you grow upward and you stretch outward and you become a tree in tree yoga. And you can use all kinds of, of perspectives of how a tree might be and the seasons and the various things and the cloud dance. There are some different ways that you can expand that cloud triangle with the cloud dance. You can have them stretch out where they're not touching their neighbor and with their arms extended, they're not going to hit each other and have them do the cloud dance where they make a cumulus cloud or then a stratus flatus where they stretch out their arms real wide. And then on tippy toes, you do the dance where you do the cirrus clouds in the top of the sky, just flicking your fingers. So tree yoga and cloud dance, just kind of two fun things that I like to engage my children with. Next slide. So when you look at their faces, do you see what I see? Do you see them fully engaged in nature, exploring, investigating, smiling, having fun, not even knowing that they're doing science? or that they're doing some kind of learning, they're playing, they're having fun. Don't take the fun away. Encourage them, help them to build those skills that they're beginning to build as a scientist. Every child is born a scientist. They touch things, they feel things, they put them in their mouth, they're exploring, they're investigating, they're observing. Encourage that natural curiosity. Next slide. Here we have some guys on the left that are collecting soil samples. They have their journal with them. And we're going to see some activities in a moment where they're going to use those soil samples to make some observations. And then collecting surface temperature. Surface temperature is always a highlight of all of the work that we do when they get to hold that IR thermometer in their hand and explore and feel important um, and, and find the, the different surface types and the different temperatures. Next slide. So collecting surface temperature data. You know, if you have 
have just a IR thermometer. They're, they're quite cheap these days. You can get one and put that in the hand of a, a child and let them explore. Um, you know, just let them go out and about and see what they discover. You don't have to tell them that different surfaces are going to be different temperatures. They'll figure that out. They'll explore. They'll point it at this and they'll point it at that. And then pretty soon you can have a conversation where you guide them in a discussion about, well, what, you know, what was the surface temperature of the grass? What was the surface temperature of that log? Or what about um, if there was some metal around that they might have observed and just have those conversations, but let them explore first. Uh, you don't have to have a fancy data chart to collect data, but you can. You can have them collect data in their journal or you can have a whiteboard where you put it up and you just kind of jot down the temperatures that you gather. And how much fun is it when you're with your friend and you get the exact same measurement? That's pretty cool. I have to say, I'm not sure that's ever happened to me um, that frequently. So that's pretty amazing that these two children were able to capture exactly the same um, surface temperature. Now, of course, they're collecting it in Fahrenheit, and that's probably where you want to start. Even though we know scientists use Celsius, they don't understand exactly the, the, uh, what that means when they hear it in Celsius. So start out by talking about the temperature in Fahrenheit and how that relates to how warm or cold it is outside, and then how that you can measure the air temperature and then measure the surface temperature. And based on the type of surface, it's going to be different. So start out with Fahrenheit. And then as they get older, they can transition into Celsius. And you can talk about why that's important so that all scientists around the world are collecting temperature in the same way. Next slide. So take them to the playground. What a perfect place to explore surface temperature. You know, what types of surfaces might you find? Well, you might find plastic, you might find wood, you might find metal, rope, grass, asphalt, all kinds of different surfaces. And it'd be really cool to do this over the course of the year. Maybe if you're at a school and you want to use the playground as a test site for collecting your surface temperature data. And you can see how that changes throughout the seasons. And you'll be surprised. The air temperature just might change more often than your surface temperature does. Next slide. Then we have the colors of the ever-changing seasons. What a perfect place to engage in nature. As they see things changing around us, as we're entering the fall, um, you know, one of my favorite, you know, each, each season I say, oh, this is my favorite season. And then, you know, winter comes and we get a good snow and I'm like, this is my favorite season. And then uh, spring and we have the flowers start to bloom and that's my favorite season. But encourage them to investigate the differences between the season, to find all of the beauty of each season, all of those things that make each season different and special just like we're all different colors and we're all very special in our own unique ways. Next slide. Now the GLOW program has a plant color guide that you can use. Um, and you can use this throughout the different seasons as the leaves um, do go through green up in the spring and then as they go through green down in the fall, you can use the color chart to look at the different um, colors they see. And if you want to take that further than just talking about different colors than the leaves, you could talk about different types of trees. Do different types of trees have different colors? You can also do a, a uh, experiment where you actually take the leaf and investigate that depending on what level of student you're working with. But the plant color guide can be used all year long to help you as you're doing your investigations. Next slide. 
Ah, this is one of my favorite go-to activities. This is called Zoom In. And I can do Zoom In with just about any part of nature that I'm exploring. I love journals and I see a lot of benefit in journals. I know that um, a lot of the children you work with may not be using words yet in their writing, but have them draw a picture, have them sketch a picture. Um, you know, even as early as they can hold a crayon in their hand, they can start to sketch, make colors and distinctions between what they're seeing. So have them keep a journal, even if they do the sketching and maybe you can help them by doing the writing. You know, what's the date? What's the weather like? They can check a box. Is it hot? Is it warm? Is it cool or cold? And then when you're talking about the seasons, how does the temperature affect what we what we wear, what we pick out for the day? You know, think about the weather and what it's going to be like. Is it going to be raining outside? Do I need a rain jacket? Talk through those different things with them. Have them make sketches in their journal to document the differences in the weather um, throughout the season. But then observe a scene in nature and have them sketch the overall picture of the whole forest or the whole seaside, or maybe it's a meadow. And then after they've had time to sketch the big picture of what they see, have them zoom in tight and close on one piece, one little piece. If you're, if you're examining a great big tree and they see a ladybug crawling up the side of the trunk, have them sketch a picture of that all zoomed in, just like you would on your phone. You take a picture of the tree and then you zoom in on the ladybug. Well, have them do that in their journal. Have them investigate. This is another globe activity um, that is available and um, just one of my favorites to do. Next picture or next slide. So we have a image of a meadow, beautiful meadow of flowers. And I also read another quote, many eyes go through the meadow, but few see the flowers in it. And that was Ralph Waldo Emerson. So look at the field of flowers, the meadow, but then zoom in. Next slide. What might we see? I may see a green bug on a green leaf. You may see a grasshopper that's inside of a flower. Zoom in close and see what you can find. And each of us are probably going to find something different. Explore those differences and encourage them to find even more. So this is a, an example of how you could do the zoom in activity the big picture of the meadow, and then zoom in on some small aspect of that. Next slide. What's buzzing in our garden? You know, you may have a garden. You may have a butterfly garden. You may have a vegetable garden. But take them outside and talk about the garden and things that you might see. What types of flowers do you have in your garden? Have them sketch that. And then find an insect, sketch that in their journal as well. Talk about the different insects they see and ask them questions about how they think the insects get food, where um, if they are uh, like a butterfly or a bee, how they might be drinking in nectar or they might be nibbling on a leaf. Talk about the different things that you see and observe. Let them tell you about what they see and observe. Next slide. Oh, I found this book recently and I just had to share it. It's the alphabet from the sky. And this is an example of remote sensing, but it is also a perfect opportunity to find your ABCs in an image that was taken from the sky. Um, and this book is um, a, just a really cool book that looks at imagery taken from above that shows us, and we can find all kinds of things. I'm sure they'll see things you may not have seen. 
and, you know, maybe find an image of your own neighborhood and see if they can identify within that image places that you might visit, maybe the grocery store or the school, or maybe even find your house. Lots of opportunity for them to continue to connect, looking at different perspectives. Next slide. What do you think they see? Looking at this image, this was actually an image that was taken by one of the camps that I work with. And I'm just curious, what were they looking at? What were they thinking when they were out and about looking and observing and collecting specimens? What might they have found? Next slide. Well, maybe they were collecting some soil samples. You can take them and have them sketch um, the color of the soil, rub a little bit of the soil on paper, talk about what they think they're going to find in their soil sample after they dig up some soil. What are they going to find as they look through that soil? Next slide. Maybe have them take that soil sample and look to see what are the larger particles Divide out the smaller particles from the larger particles. Are there, is there plant material in their soil sample? Do they find any critters? I was doing a training with some elementary school teachers and I did this activity with them. And it was kind of cool when you started hearing those squeals across the room when they found something. Somebody found a worm in theirs and you would have thought, you know, they were going to fall out of the chair. But the kids are going to love that. They're going to love to find things in their soil sample. Let them investigate and discover. Maybe collect different, different soil from different locations and see how those are different. Next slide. This is another fun activity where you take a bottle or a jar and take a soil sample and you pour the soil into the jar. You fill it covering the soil with about an inch or so of water and you shake it and then you set it down and you observe it. And over time, it's going to settle out into the different layers, sand at the bottom, then silt and clay organic matter and then the water that is doesn't have anything dissolved in it will be there but your organic matter will quite often be um, on top of the water floating and observe it at 10 minutes and see what they see and then maybe in a couple of hours and then come back the next day uh, my grandkids did this activity and they loved it they had a lot of fun with it but I would recommend that you use a plastic jar or bottle just in case they get happy with the shaking and they drop it. Next slide. Globe storybooks. Now this is one of those um, go-tos for when you want to explore nature with your children and maybe it's a rainy day, but it's a way that you can introduce a new concept um, the characters in the storybooks are Anita and Simon and Dennis, and they're always making observations about their world. They're noticing this and that. They're noticing that when they went to the creek in the spring and they go back in the fall, it looks different. And they're writing in their journals and they're making observations that there are seven books, and I believe that she has the link to, to this in the chat, and you can access those. There are PDFs that you can download. There are e-readers that you can um, access that, are, that read it aloud to them. But the themes are Earth as a system, clouds, water, seasons, aerosols, climate, and soils. And um, go to the next slide, please. And this one spotlights the scoop on soils. And in this book, they have a dog. And the dog is always running off and digging holes. And they're running after it, going to fill in the holes before, you know, the neighbor gets mad or the gardener down the street gets upset that there was a hole dug in their garden. And they find that as they're doing this, that the soil that they see is different in all of these different locations. And they begin to write that down and make a chart in their journal. 
But the books, one of the cool things about them is you can do a picture walk. You don't even have to read the text. And you can do a picture walk and learn so much about what's going on in the story. Next slide. We also have a cool way for you to do a weather um, weather bar. I know that when I was student teaching in kindergarten, weather time and circle time were always something we did um, and had so much fun with it. But thinking back, I'm like, ooh, if I had only known about this activity where we could have used Legos to construct when, uh, when it was sunny or cloudy or when it was snowing or raining and have this where they can do this each month and then maybe take a picture of that. And then over the course of the year, see how the weather changed from season to season or month to month. Next slide, please. There's a world of opportunities to explore. And make sure, though, that when you take them out to explore, that you're very safety conscious. And know in a little bit we're going to have an eclipse. Please do not allow them to look at that without having proper eyewear. Um, but it is so much fun, even for a young child, to get to experience that eclipse. So make sure they have safety glasses when you do that. Make sure you wear safety glasses when you view the eclipse. Next slide. Now we are going to have a um, annular solar eclipse that will be October the 14th. Now I know that um, it's just a fun thing to go and explore, but you also could do some air temperature data collecting on the day. See if there's a difference in the air temperature during the eclipse. Take the temperature before, during, and after. And then what about surface temperature? How will that be affected? So pull out those IR thermometers and um, explore what you find. Have them maybe sketch what they saw before and during and after and talk about those differences. What about the animals? Did you notice any difference in the animals? Were the birds still flying through the sky? Were they still singing? What did you notice about the animals during the eclipse? Next slide. Do we all relate in the same way to what we see? Think about that for a minute. Um, in this image, we have some, it's a fall image. There are leaves, there, there's a butterfly, but it's really, um, it's blended in to to the um, to the leaves that we see, but one of the things that I have always found disturbing is when we're working with children and we tell them what they're supposed to see, and then what they're supposed to think about what they saw. You know, when I was teaching middle school, I would become very concerned about the fact they didn't know how to ask questions. They lost that somewhere along the way. So by having them explore and have the freedom to ask questions, to think about what they saw and be engaged in what they saw and relate to that in their own way, we are actually setting them up for a positive learning experience throughout their whole life. Um, and you know, the, the skill of asking good questions is really an important one, especially as you think about uh, STEM and being engaged in a, a STEM career or anything of that nature. So I know that sometimes questions and questions and questions, why, 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 can um, become monotonous, but have patience. Remember when you were that child and you just wanted to know all you could about the magic of the world around you and allow them to have that same opportunity as they're exploring the world around them. Next slide. So nature-based NASA explorations for young minds. You know, I think about the words that we use and the actions that go along with those types of words. 
you know, making observations, whether it's the sky above and all the types of clouds, whether it's the trees and the changes of the season or the meadow or the zoom in and you see the bug or the butterfly. Making those observations is such an important time for kids. Encourage that. Encourage their thoughts and their ideas. Make predictions. You know, I was somewhere recently and um, the educator was having them make predictions, but then she would encourage them to correct their predictions if they weren't correct. And I was very distraught. I was, um, you know, when we're asking for predictions, predictions aren't, aren't always right. It's important to let them make their predictions, and then discover for themselves the answer to what they thought might happen. Some of the greatest discoveries have occurred because of wrong predictions, false hypotheses. You know, don't have them go back and correct their prediction because a prediction is just a guess. It's important that they learn that process. Sketches. Making sketches is very important for them to document change over time. Even, even growth in their own learning, allow them to have that opportunity to make those sketches. You know, when we first, they first start out, it may just look like a bunch of scratches and scribbles to you, but over time, those are going to become something that develops. And I bet even when they make those scratches and scribbles, if you ask them about them, they can tell you a whole story about what they wrote and what they drew and what their thoughts were. Pictures. Pictures are so important. And as those sketches become more sophisticated and they have those questions that develop or pictures that develop from them, their learning is going to become so visible in what they're writing about. Questions. As I said, encourage them to ask questions and, in, and encourage them to learn the answers to their questions through inquiry-based learning. Let them explore. Um, give them the materials to use. Give them the places to be. Take them outside. Um, you know, this is a day and age where too many children are inside playing video games all day long. Take them outside. I didn't have a video game when I was little, and I am so grateful uh, for all the times I heard mom call out the door, Tina Rochelle, it's getting dark. Get back in this house. And what a fun day I had had and how much I had learned and explored. And all of that is still part of who I am. But most importantly, don't take away the play. They're having fun. They're having a good time. They see it as play. All the time they're learning, um, they are playing. And I wanted to kind of mention that some of the greatest discoveries have come through observations of nature. Think about flight. Now, just earlier, I had jets that were going over above my head, uh, above my office. And, you know, they're testing those and they're always working to improve them. But original flight came from observing birds. And then think about um, submarines. Did you ever think about a submarine was designed after watching a whale? That's pretty cool to think about. And then, you know, sonar came about because of bats and dolphins and all of the observations that went into the forethought for those things. And then even the law of gravity. The law of gravity came about by watching an apple fall from a tree. So don't discourage them from making their observations and never tell them it's a dumb idea because their ideas are so important. And being out in nature is going to be a lasting life experience. Next slide. So as you encourage them to explore, you know, provide them with some resources to do that. A magnifying glass in the hand of a child is an awesome thing to have and allow them that time to explore. And 
Thank you so much for allowing me to be with you today. And I believe at this time we have time for questions. Is that correct, Miss Emily? Yes. Thank you so much, Tina. That was great. So many ideas. And I was, um, I, I'm not a, in the classroom anymore, but I was just thinking about how many things that would be so easy to just take and apply in um, the classroom. So thank you so much. Um, we had a couple of questions submitted before, so I just want to remind everyone we have a few minutes for questions here. If you have any questions for Tina, please put those in the chat or the Q&A. Um, but I wanted to call out a couple of questions that were asked um, through registration. So you mentioned um, those temperature uh, gauges at IO thermometer. Mm -hmm. Yes, IO thermometer, um, as well as magnifying glasses. I wonder if there are any other um, tools that you like to introduce into the classroom that might um, encourage curiosity or exploration. There any One of the tools that you saw, I'm sure in, in the pictures, were the little soil samplers. They look kind of like a T, kind of a handle at the top, and they're hollow, and they're made out of metal, and you can get those pretty pretty cheap um, on Amazon or a place uh, such as that. And if you take them outside and go down into the soil and do a quick turn and pull it out, you're going to get a sample of soil. And even on my initial slide, my title slide, I had the little girl who had pulled that soil sample out. And the, the look on her face is just so cool. Um, you know, have them explore with, with taking, we call it's a soil sampler is what it's called. Um, taking the soil sampler around to different spots and collecting different sets of soil to look at the differences. Um, obviously, a um, air temperature thermometer is good um, to have. Um, and, uh, a sh you know, a hand shovel uh, for, for digging up soil as well is, is good because sometimes you need a little bit more than you get in that soil sampler for like the soil shake. Um, wow. Uh, there's so many things, you know, a lot of times when I have them look at soil, I also like those little hand viewers. They're like a microscope, but they're, they're not, um, they're made out of hard plastic and, you know, they, they don't require to be plugged into electricity, but put a little bit of that under and have them look through the scope at the grains of the sand. Uh, it's a magical thing to look at. Um, and, and then maybe the, the silt and the clay and have them look at how they're different. Um, so those are just some additional ones, but I could Sure. I'm sure there's so many. <laughs> um, and of course, it's so exciting that we're doing this um, webinar when there is a, an eclipse coming up very soon next week. Um, and so there was a question about that. You talked about some things that you can do. Um, we have a lot of early childhood educators in our audience. So um, kind of a two part question. One, is there anything you would specifically do with young children, like preschool age around the eclipse when you were talking about it. And then also if someone was asking, because of course safety is so important, um, if you had any idea of a source that might um, give free eclipse glasses or anything like that. Well, obviously you if, you're, if you're close to a NASA center, um, each center has, a, a, has some um, and then um, there are places that you can order them from. Uh, I'm, I'm not at liberty to speak about which ones those might be specifically, but make sure that you read um, the specifications on them and, and, and be very aware of what you're getting because some of them are just colored film. <laughs> you want to make sure they're going to protect your mm -hmm. eyes. But for young kids, um, an activity you know, have them construct an earth and a moon and a sun and play out the actions that occur during an eclipse. What's happening um, makes that much more realistic and understandable for a child. Very cool. Great idea. Okay. And I think probably only have time for one more question. And um, I know a lot of the activities that you discussed um, were not focused on you know, space and the stars and the planets and everything. But we did um, have someone ask what 
um, one or two of your favorite activities connected to space would be um, to do with young children? Well, you know, we all get into rocketry and everybody loves rockets. But, you know, with your younger children, you really don't want to invest in a high expensive uh, market, uh, model rocket kit. But you can construct a paper um, rocket that wraps around a film canister. And if you put um, a, a fourth of a Alka-Seltzer tablet into that film canister, make sure you cover it with their little rocket ship. And then when you go to put the top, right before you put the top on, you pour in a little bit of vinegar and you put the top on, it does a little pop up and the little ones are so excited about that. I did that with my children when they were like three or four and we had so much fun with it. And they wanted to experiment with not just a fourth of the Alka-Seltzer, but then they wanted to test what happened if you put the whole thing in. Of and course. Yeah, there you go. That sounds so fun. I love that. And yes, I was also enthralled with rockets as a kid. <laughs> um, let's see. That's that's definitely one of my favorites. And um, I like um, studying about the craters on the moon. And there's a really um, cool um, activity where you can have a piece of like watercolor paper and you get paint, um, some different colors of paint and have them um, dip a straw into that paint and then blow through it. And it makes these little splashes on that paper and it kind of look, you can draw a circle so that it looks like the craters on the moon. Those well, are kind of a couple of my favorites. Yeah, those are so fun. Perfect. Um, well, there are a couple comments in here just um, thanking you for your time and for sharing that this is a wonderful presentation. And I appreciated that it was full of so many ideas. I know at this time of year, sometimes it's great to just have something that you can grab and do with your students. So um, thank you so much, Tina, for the time that you took to prepare this presentation and to share with us. Um, it is so cool that we're able to do this together. Um, so thank you very much. And with that, I also just wanna share one quick little note for everybody um, before we wrap up here. Thank you all for being here as well. We really appreciate you taking the time. Um, as mentioned, this was recorded. We'll share the recording. Christy was sharing resources in the chat throughout, but we'll also make sure that we link to those from um, our website, naturalstart.org, and we'll send an email out once the recording is posted and once the resources are uploaded there. So you'll be able to get all of these things. Um, and also I would encourage you just to explore the GLOBE website. As Tina said, there's so many more resources there than um, she was able to, to dig into today. So please check it out and explore those. Um, and one little final note um, from us at Natural Start is just to, um, highlight that we do host a conference every year um, and our conference next year is going to be in Portland, Oregon, July 31st to August 3rd. And we hope that as many of you um, as possible will be able to join us there because um, if you love Tina's presentation as I did, uh, our conference is, you know, 50 plus of those um, presentations over a few days. There's so much to learn and so many wonderful people to learn from and alongside. Um, so. We encourage you to keep that on your calendar and check out for more information for that um, over the next few months. And then lastly, we hope that you just stay in touch with us. Um, you can follow us on Facebook or Instagram, send us an email at info at naturalstart.org anytime um, with questions or resources. Um, and then last, our website has a lot of great information as well. So please stay in touch um, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.